Hi, and welcome to CYPA Sit-Downs. My name is Nick Curry. Sitting down with us today is the Ableton programmer for the Broadway shows Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen. We're very excited to welcome to the show, Mr. Scott Wasserman. Scott, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Of course, thanks for having me. I think when I saw Hamilton, like many people, I thought, oh, the guy that did the Ableton programming, uh, he must he must have grown up working on synthesizers in his girlfriend. <laughs> doing in that. But uh, I understand that that's not really the case. Can you tell us a little bit about your theater and music background? Right. Yeah. So I, uh, when I was growing up, I performed theater, you know, at my school and in like summer theater camps and community theaters and things. Uh, and I was always involved with music programs in my schools as well. Um, I was a pianist since I was five. And then I started playing trumpet when I got into elementary school and played that all the way through high school. Um, when I was uh, deciding what I wanted to major in college, I was at first going back and forth between being a musical theater performer or a voice major. And then I was thinking more the behind the scenes kind of like music theory and composition kind of uh, path. And I ended up going to school for music composition. Um, and for me, I think that was the right decision because now what I love to do is all of the like, like I said, the behind the scenes kind of creation stuff. Um, and I do a lot less composing now than I did at that time. And now it's more arranging and orchestrating stuff, but it's all the same skills that I learned in school there. Um, but as far as like music technology goes, you know, I, I played keyboards, but I wasn't really like a, a gearhead or anything. And I wasn't collecting synths and stuff. Uh, in college, I took a music technology class, but it didn't really go more in depth than, you know, working with logic and Pro Tools and Reason and stuff. Uh, and I wasn't really like designing electronic music at that point. Uh, so uh, it wasn't until I started working on the development of new musicals uh, that I started using logic more for creating like demo recordings uh, of arrangements. Um, and also like getting logic sessions from composers in order to be able to transcribe the music that they had written in demo form. Uh, and, and then I didn't start using Ableton until I was working on Hamilton, actually. <laughs> so um, the, the way that that all came about, um, I was working with Alex Lacamoire, the orchestrator of Hamilton. Uh, we were working together on Annie in 2012, there was a Broadway revival and I was just the music assistant at that time doing finale work, the notation software um, and transcriptions and just general, you know, intern type duties for the music team on the show. And Alex Lackmore was the dance arranger on that production. So he and I started working closely together on that show and hit it off. And at the same time that Annie was going into production, he was starting the very first readings and workshops of Hamilton and asked me to come along with him and, and join the team. So um, we started working together on that. And again, I was still the music assistant at that time, just doing family work, transcriptions, whatever he needed me to do. And obviously, since it was the early stages of the show, it was just like us as a two person music team. Uh, and as we started doing more readings and workshops, it became clear that we needed to add more than just piano to the sound of the show as we were presenting it. Uh, so I started playing beats along with what he was doing on piano. Uh, and that grew into starting to learn Ableton and programming the actual loops into the software rather than just like playing them back on a drum pad. So, so that was really the, the introduction to Ableton for me. <laughs> yeah, can you explain for somebody who's never used Ableton, what features in Ableton make it really well suited for this particular application? For sure. So Ableton was originally designed as a DJing software. So the whole interface and the whole playback system in Ableton is designed for live performance uh, versus a program like Logic or Pro Tools, which is more commonly used just in uh, the recording of audio and also in editing, mixing, mastering, that kind of thing. Ableton is more of a, you know, on your feet kind of a, a program where you can load in different drum beats and samples and loops and decide 
whether you want to just play them back as a, a static audio file, or if you want to loop them, warp them, change the tempo, change the pitch, add effects all in real time. So in order to uh, keep up with the pace of the workshop phase of a show, we needed a program that was this flexible and this malleable in that stage. So we were able to take what we planned on as the beat for my shot, for instance, uh, but then in rehearsal, as we were working with Andy Blankenbuehler, he could say, we need to extend the dance break by this many beats, or we need to go into a new tempo here, or we need to do this, this, like lose the kick, lose the stare, whatever we need to do. All of that is immediately at your fingertips in Ableton to edit on the fly. So. What other softwares do you gravitate to to create content? Right. I use Logic Pro most often. Um, and obviously there's a lot of like external sample libraries and things that can be used in conjunction with Logic. So for instance, I use like the East West Composer Cloud, which is a really good introduction to using different sample libraries. That's like a monthly subscription service rather than spending like $10,000 on one string library, you know? Um, so I use Logic for a lot of my creation of uh, electronic music and orchestration demos as well. How long does it take to set up an entire show? I mean, I'm sure the, the tech process of any show is long. And like you said, it might come with changes to say like, this needs to be longer. This We're going to omit this number, right. or something new here. Yeah, so the the development of any given show is going to take a different amount of time based on uh, where it's at in the process. You know, for Hamilton, for instance, I started programming the Ableton content for Hamilton in the summer of 2013, uh, and then it didn't get to Broadway until the summer of 2015. So it was a full two years of development and like slowly building the show together to get it to that point. So it can be that kind of a process where it's just like adding little by little as the show is being made, or uh, it could be a process more like a show uh, I did um, in California, uh, Diana, the musical about Princess Diana, where I came in and started working on the show right when they started their tech process. So I did all of the Ableton programming between tech and opening of the show, which was just about three weeks, right? So depending on where the show is at in the process and where I'm brought in, uh, it takes a different amount of time. But, you know, my, my preference is always to be involved with the show from the ground up so I can be part of, like, building the structure of the show uh, as it's being created uh, rather than just sitting and programming all, all in one fell swoop because it's it can be pretty stressful, especially because um, Ableton is the kind of a program where uh, you can have a domino effect of errors if something goes wrong within it. So like if something is off in your programming in song number two, it's likely everything after song number two is going to have some kind of an issue with it. So, so for my brain, it's always better to like be prepared and methodically go through the whole show rather than trying to just throw it all up on its feet. So that makes sense. One of our students asked, once you get the show set, does it remain frozen, set in stone, or at what point do you go back and change elements, or what kind of elements have you changed for these shows? Sure. So I think anytime a show gets to Broadway, there is like a freezing date of um, after the preview performances are done and when we get to the opening night, the show is then frozen. And usually things don't change again until um, national tours go out or the show is uh, made available for licensing, right? So for Hamilton, for instance, um, nothing on the Broadway show changed after the show opened uh, until we took the show to Chicago. And then once we were in Chicago, not big changes, but we made some small changes in like the tempo map of the show and in the sound of a couple different loops and things here and there, just based on what we've learned in a second tech process and like how to improve the show's quality. Uh, and since then we've made little tweaks for London and little tweaks for some of the other tours. Uh, same thing with Dear Evan Hansen, but for the most part, the like, structure of the show stayed the same. Um, I know I have friends that did the programming for Mean Girls. They put in a brand new opening number to the show when it went on tour and then have since brought that opening number back to Broadway. So you never know what kind of changes might come in and after the fact. But, but for the most part, I would say once shows open on Broadway, they kind of remain frozen. 
I'm sure like with anything that you work on and then come back to, you find those things that you're like, ah, oh, I wish I had known how to do this when I did it the first time, because it would have saved <laughs> so much time or I could have done it in fewer steps or it would have been easier uh, along the way. Completely. You yeah. create this show and then you turn it over. Who actually interacts with Ableton during the show in each of the, the shows that you've worked on? So for the most part, shows that I've been working on lately, uh, the conductor is the one controlling Ableton's playback. Uh, Hamilton is the exception to that. So, uh, and like you were saying with like looking back at shows that you've done previously, and like, oh, this is what I wish I had known then or wish I had done differently. Since Hamilton was the first one that I programmed, there's a lot that I've since learned from and gone back and like changed based on my like workflow and also in things like the the actual triggering and playback of it. Um, so on Hamilton, the percussionist is the one that is actually triggering the goes on Ableton. And for that show, it ended up making sense because the conductor is very busy in what they're doing with their keyboard one part and their conducting of the show. And it's just such a massive show to have to have <laughs> a grasp on, right? So the percussionist has um, foot switches that I can show you just like this, these boss foot switches, right? So the percussionist has four of these and there's a go, a stop, a previous and a next. So uh, the ideal run of the show, the percussionist only has to hit the go pedal at certain points indicated in the score. And at every one of those different go marks, a new uh, scene in Ableton or a new song flow in Ableton happens that has the click and effects and tracks and all of that. Um, and if there are any, you know, irregularities in the run of the show where they need to stop or go back or forward in the order of things, that's what the other three pedals are for. Um, so aside from Hamilton's setup with that, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, uh, Great Comet, uh, Diana, a lot of the other shows I've done recently, it's all in the conductor's hands. Uh, and even if they're doing a keyboard conductor chair, they will often have either a foot pedal like this, or they'll have a control box that just has physical buttons on it for go, stop, previous, next, whatever it is. Uh, and the conductor will be the one triggering it at that point. I know one of the reasons that you selected Ableton for these shows was because they had pre-recorded elements that would be really hard either because of the effects that are on them or just the nature of the instruments hard to recreate in real time. Would right. a traditional show benefit from having an Ableton click track? Is this the way of the future now? I think so. Um, I think just having a click in general, even if there's no track attached to it, is going to help create consistency in your show. And especially if there are elements of the show that are timed to the music, uh, things like scene transitions or video playback or just even choreography where the dancers are expecting a certain tempo every time the click track is completely useful for those purposes even without any audio content on them so ableton can be used just for a click track and then also for integration with other technical elements using midi cues and time code uh, and for instance in Dear Evan Hansen that's one of the main uses of, of Ableton. There's there's not a ton of actual audio content uh, coming from Ableton for Dear Evan Hansen. It's mostly handled by the, the live pit um, but the majority of the show is done to click track and there's time code running throughout and the video and lighting departments are syncing up with that time code so all of their cues are happening at specified points within the music. So. so how did you, as the programmer, interact with the people who were programming, the synthesizers, and uh, or orchestrating this to say, this is going to go into the, into the backing track, we're going to do this live? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, on both Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen, it was the same crew for, for those. We had Alex Lackamore was the orchestrator and the keyboard programmer was uh, Randy Cohen. Um, so one of the things that I typically do uh, is just handle the uh, software side of things. So just handle the actual programming of Ableton and the content that goes onto it. Whereas uh, the hardware that's running the Ableton system is provided by the keyboard programmer. So for Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen, it's Randy Cohen's responsibility to provide the computers, interfaces, 
MIDI, like pedal hookups, all that kind of thing. Uh, so I can focus on just the programming of the software. So, so that's one way in which we collaborate is making sure that, you know, the hardware is all accounted for, but if anything needs to be updated in the software, that's all my responsibility, right? Um, and then as far as working with the orchestrator, uh, it will be exactly what you said in the process of him deciding, uh, I have these uh, loops that need to be played back and they'll be more effectively played by Ableton rather than a live player because the other two keyboard players are busy at the moment or the uh, loop is so precise that no player could play that pattern of 30 second notes accurately or whatever it is. So that kind of stuff usually goes on to Ableton. Um, and as far as the synths go, you know, th those are more, uh, it's more just creating the actual sounds uh, that are being played on rather than creating sequences of things. Um, and then also for Hamilton, uh, it was in Randy's department, also with a guy named Will Wells, a music producer on the show, uh, to create the drum samples that would go on the electronic drum pad, the Roland SPD, that the percussionist is playing as well. So, so anything that just needed to be a one-shot sample that the percussionist would actually hit during the show would be sort of in their department. Uh, and then I would actually handle loops and things. What about interacting with the people who run the soundboard each night? I assume that it's pre-mixed stereo out or multi-channel out back to the soundboard. Maybe not a whole lot of things that need to be adjusted each night because you're going to have something really consistent there. Yeah, that's always the goal. And that's a big conversation that I have with any sound designer before I start working with them on a show. Uh, I think the, the best practice for coordinating with Ableton and sound is that you do mix it internally in Ableton. And if there's anything that like sticks out to the sound designer uh, during a performance, even if it's on its own channel and they could just turn that fader down, it's better to just do it on my end and they can leave their Ableton fader at zero, you know, the whole show. So that I think that's always the goal. Um, in addition to the actual, uh, you know, playback from Ableton, there's a lot of coordination with sound in terms of those MIDI cues. And uh, usually if there's time code, it will like go through the sound department to then get to the lighting department. So there's a lot of coordination on that as well. Um, and then for, for each show, there's a different um, number of actual outputs used from Ableton, depending on what kind of control is needed on their end from the soundboard. So for instance, Hamilton has uh, a stereo pair for tracks and a stereo pair for effects, right? Um, and those effects are just on a different channel to the soundboard so they can choose to route them differently from the tracks if they want to or put different processing on them uh, if they want. And those effects are things like gunshots and cannon blasts and things that need to be treated in a different way than the, the loops, right? Um, but for a show like Diana, we have 32 different outputs from Ableton. And that way the sound people can uh, choose, they want like the strings to come from over here and the shakers to come from over there. And, you know, they can do all of that routing themselves if they have all of that granular routing done. So yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> you, uh, I heard you say in another interview about there are still some elements that are cued by now let me rephrase that. There are some elements that are played back from QLab or another software, even though they're queued in in the Ableton track. Ableton communicates there. What what was the purpose? Is was it also with routing to decide like how those sound effects were going to be played throughout the theater? Exactly. Yeah, it's either routing control. So you know, back to like cannon blasts and things. For instance, if there's a whole sequence of cannon blasts in the Yorktown dance break, for instance. All of those are MIDI triggers from Ableton that are triggering cues from QLab at the soundboard. And they have even more control over where each of those cannon blasts comes from and you know how much of them goes to the subs versus not, that kind of thing. Um, but also things like the rewind uh, sequence in Hamilton, uh, which has the vocal recording of Angelica and Eliza in it. Every time you have a new uh, actress performing each of those roles, uh, they re-record those vocals and have a separate stem 
uh, for each of those actresses, right, playing the role. So it's the sound board operator's responsibility to load up the particular rewind file for who's performing that day, and Ableton just sends the MIDI signal to play the cue back, knowing that it's going to be the correct actresses' voices from Cube Lab, right? So that's, it's a little bit easier to give the responsibility to the, the soundboard operator um, to load those kinds of files into Q Lab rather than swapping them out in the actual Ableton file every day since it's the percussionist who's queuing it, right? And you mentioned time code. Can you explain how time code works in a show like Dear Evan Hansen? Yes, so the advantage to time code over MIDI for a show like Dear Evan Hansen uh, is that MIDI cues are all just individual MIDI notes, right, being communicated between Ableton and the program like QLab. And when you receive the MIDI note in question, then your, your cue fires, right? Time code is a continuous uh, audio file that has information embedded into it that represents hours, minutes, seconds, and frames that keep scrolling by as they play back. Um, so a video department, for instance, can sync up to the time code and be constantly reading where it is at any given moment as it's playing back from Ableton and can either request specific cue markers from me um, to say like, we want to put a picture of Evan up on the screen when he says the word waving, where is waving in the time code? And then I give that marker to them and give it to them. Or they can actually like lock into certain markers themselves that they like, you know, they can record the time code and then go back and view it and like attach cues to different markers in the time code. So they don't always have to be asking for specific MIDI cue requests from me. They can just have the time code throughout. So, so that's usually how, how that works. Ableton kind of becomes the master clock then for all of these other systems. Either exactly. Through MIDI time code or, or through the SMPT time code. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There are some other questions here about kind of like production and things like that. Did you want to show us a little bit about the Ableton software while we're on it? Sure. Yeah, I have the Dear Evan Hansen session up, so I can just show you a little bit about how it's organized. That'd be fantastic. So this is what the session view in Ableton looks like. So Ableton has two different views to it, session view and arrangement view. Uh, session view is what looks like this sort of Excel spreadsheet, right, with all the different individual cells. And you see that all of the actual tracks in session view are displayed vertically, right? So if I scroll over to the left here, I have like a track of demo recordings, a track of drones. This one's just called tracks. And then it's a group that I can open up. And within it, you see guitar, whirly, piano, pad, glitch, right? All these different individual audio tracks. Uh, and then going further over, you see these are labeled with what their outputs would normally be uh, for the show rig. So I was one and two, three, four has sound effects, five, six has ensemble vocals, right? Uh, and then over to eight here is SMPTE, which is time code, right? This is uh, labeled in those hours, minutes, seconds, and frames like I was talking about. Uh, MIDI notes, MIDI control changes, some pre-show sound effects, and then this is our click track group that has the actual clicks and uh, count-ins to it. And then on the right side of the screen here, you see a master column, and this is where we label what song it is, and then what section each of these individual uh, horizontal lines in Ableton correspond to. And each horizontal line here is called a scene, right? So this scene has just bars one through four, the intro to Waving Through a Window. This scene has the first verse of Waving Through a Window, bars five through 20, starting with the lyric, I've learned to slam on the brakes, right? So uh, you can see each of the tracks has their own faders down here with different levels set. Some of them are muted right now. And then if I opened up this input and output routing information, I could send each track to its own output through whatever interface that I'm, I'm using, right? Right now I have them all set to, to one, two, so you can hear it. Um, so each individual cell right here represents an audio file that's been loaded, right? So in the click column here, if I double click on this, you can see it has this waveform here of our click sound, right? And it's just one bar of click that's looping and we've set follow actions 
down here on the left-hand side that to tell Ableton how long to keep playing this one audio file for before moving on to the, the next one down. So basically that is the way that all of this functions uh, is if I hit play right here at the, the waving whoosh, right? Then it's going to just flow down the order of all of these different scenes uh, through the whole first verse, pre-chorus, chorus, et cetera, until we get to a vamp section. And then you see this next section here that has a different color label uh, is our next actual cue where the conductor would hit go again on measure 58 out of the vamp. And that takes us through the rest of the song. And then they'll be queued up for the following song, the way we threw a window reprise. So the whole goal of setting it up this way is to make it as user friendly as possible, where the conductor is just looking at this master column on the screen, seeing this uh, order of the, uh, the song, uh, and they're just hitting go at those designated spots uh, that line up in the score. So. So you can predetermine, even though you're in that live view, you can predetermine how long or how many times through each section before going on and then combine that with, okay, we're waiting for a character to say this line before we cue this next thing, even in the middle of the song. That's why you have that extra go cue in there. Exactly. Too. Yes. Yeah. Once, once we get to this scene after flowing through from the start of the song, it'll just keep vamping and vamping and vamping until this out cue is hit and we go on, right? And you'll notice that time code stops in the vamp because since time is not uh, going to be the same <laughs> for every performance and how long you're sitting in that vamp, it doesn't make sense to keep time code running through it. Uh, it's better to just wait and then restart your time code when you re-enter the song. So that way you know it's going to be the same every time. You just pick a new time code that's the starting point then after the fact? Right, exactly. So you can see that this song starts with one hour, zero minutes, zero seconds, zero frames right on it, right? And then I don't remember why this decision was made for this number, but we start at one hour, one minute, 35 seconds, zero frames. This is the next time that it jumps in, right? Uh, and then you'll see if I open up these groups on the side here, there's different uh, audio files of, here's like a guitar sample, here's a pulse sample, which is sort of an EP, like a whirly pulse. Um, and then you can see in my effects group, there's this like whoosh into the song. So each of these are kept on their own separate channels or their own separate tra tracks so that, again, we can do that individual mixing of each element as we're working on the show. So if we wanted a little bit more of the guitar, a little bit less of the pulse, we could do that internally in Ableton rather than having just one stem we're playing back and have to like rebounce it from logic every time or something like that. Right. With all the MIDI dummy cues that are in there. That's just a place saver. That's just something that, you know, if we needed to add something there or. So this is related to those follow actions, right? So since we're hitting play just on this first scene, in order for Ableton to start playing any scenes further down in the line, you need to have follow actions set up to tell it when to move on to the next scene down. So if you're uh, waiting to fire something like a couple scenes down, you need to have what's called a dummy clip in place before that point in order to keep the flow going to then get to whatever you're, you're actually trying to cue later on. So in this case, this MIDI dummy is just an empty clip that just plays for two beats before segueing into this MIDI note, which is F. Negative two, right? So right after that whoosh, Ableton's going to start that time code as listed and send the note F minus negative two to right. whatever and that's routed. Right, and I can show you that. I'll, I'll hit play right here, and you'll watch that it starts flowing down in the, the order of each of these scenes after each specified amount of time. So, you know, this is just two beats for the first scene and then four bars for the next scene, and then, you know, I'll just stop it a little bit after that. But, but here's what the... Uh, Ableton content for waving through a window sounds like in the band's ears, right? So they're just hearing the click track and then whatever is actually playing back from Ableton. Three, four. Here's bar four, it'll move on. There's the first verse. So Ableton's just flowing down, right? And you can see these dummy cues are still activated, waiting to queue up what's coming next, right? And you have your 
guitar and pulse sounds over here that are looping, playing back. And now we move on to the first pre-chorus, right? So, so that's the basic idea. It's really neat to, to see kind of behind the curtain on, uh, on the works. <laughs> and then I assume each musician in the pit has some sort of device, a personal mixing device to balance the, their input from the other members of the band, the drums, the click track. Right, they have uh, avioms, so they have their own uh, mix that they can set to, to hear each of the elements. Mm -hmm. is, is there a separate person mixing the, the monitor stuff versus the front of house for these shows? No, it's just one front of house operator, uh, and the you know the the monitoring is all done through those AVM settings. So each player just saves their own preset, and if there's a sub or anything, like they'll come in and they can have their own preset saves on a separate channel on the AVM too. So it's all it's all kind of done before we get to performance. That's very cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So outside of the Ableton programming, you also are a composer. You have a, a podcast called Song Salad. Yeah. Uh, about, like, how do you refresh your ideas and not get stuck in a rut? And I thought the whole concept of Song Salad is an interesting way to kind of keep your chops fresh and uh, and hone that skill, you know, week in and week out. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, that's a good point. And it's not something I necessarily intended, but it ended up happening that way. But uh, so Song Salad is a show where my friend Shannon and I uh, were writing partners and we've been friends and partners since uh, college. Uh, every week we take a random genre of music and a random topic in the form of a Wikipedia article and we have to combine the two into a song and I do the music and Shannon does the lyrics. Uh, so we found a list of like 500 plus music genres online and put them all into an Excel spreadsheet and there's a randomized range button on the Excel spreadsheet and whatever pops up to the top is going to be what genre we do next as long as it's something that's like achievable, meaning it has lyrics and it's not like a, like, you know, folk music system that has the tuning system that I can't replicate or something like that, you know? So uh, I've learned so many more styles of music through the research we've done on this podcast and uh, have done a lot of research into genres where like I've been vaguely familiar with it just from like you know I know the sound of that genre but I never knew what to call it that kind of a thing so it's allowed me to do more of a deep dive into those those areas of music I wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards in my own listening um, so yes I think that's one way to keep the ideas fresh and and get like inspiration from other sources is to just find genres that are niche find genres that you wouldn't necessarily seek out yourself um listen to other music podcasts like uh song exploder is a fantastic podcast where they do like a, a deep dive into one song per episode with the artist that created it and like break down all the elements and how they created each track um, so things like that are great sources of, of inspiration what do you love about producing your own music i mean in this in this format, you get to make all the creative decisions. How do you know what instrumentation to pick? I mean, maybe that's based on the genre you're working on for this specific podcast. But in general, when you're writing your own music, there was a great question about like instrumentation, taking up the, the range from the low frequencies, the mid-range. How do you know when to keep adding and when the song is at that right point where you, you things start to get muddy if you add too much? Right. It's, you know, it's still something that uh, takes a lot of, thought and uh, care in each song that you work on. Um, I find that one of the reasons that I do more arranging and orchestrating now than composing is that I find it more inspiring and more enjoyable to take like someone else's song that they've just written for piano and voice or just guitar and voice and imagine what it could sound like if it were expanded to other instruments. Uh, and then the pressure's off me a little bit to actually compose the thing. And then I can just focus on <laughs> what it would sound like with these other layers and other elements. Uh, and again, that, that is based on genre a lot of the time. Uh, it's also oftentimes just based on limitations of if we're dealing with a real production of a show, 
what the makeup of the pit has to be in terms of like budget and size of the pit and who's available for personnel to play these instruments. So uh, there can be a lot of creativity created through the constraint of knowing you only have a berry sax, a piano, and a drum kit to work with. How are you going to make it sound different every song? You know, so so those kinds of challenges are exciting to me. Um, but if I'm like left to my own devices and just composing something, uh, usually I'll uh, keep adding elements and keep adding layers uh, until I do reach that point where I feel like okay, it's <laughs> there's too much going on. It's too muddy. It's too chaotic. Right? You kind of just have to feel that out and then and then pair it back. What skills or classes have you taken to to develop yourself? you said you didn't really have much of a music production or music technology background in college. Like where have you, have you taught yourself or have you like found courses or, or resources that would help somebody who wants to produce, get better at, at what you're doing? You mentioned sound, uh, song exploder. Right. Song exploder is a really just useful tool for, in the form of entertainment. Right. Um, so listening to things like that and listening to what other producers have done, uh, and not necessarily even like working with them to see what their techniques are, but just hearing what they've done and then seeing if I could replicate those sounds, you know, uh, those kinds of things help me a lot. Um, I, when I first started working with Ableton, I watched a lot of just YouTube tutorials, um, rather than, uh, taking the time and money to, to go through a class. If you can't, uh, spend that, uh, you can find a lot of resources just on YouTube in terms of like, if you have specific questions, like how do I get my click track to function in this way? There's a lot of resources there. Um, same thing with logic. And, and then, yeah, working with other people in the business, um, on Dear Evan Hansen, I co-programmed the Ableton work with Enrico Detrizio, and he knew a lot more about logic than I did at that time. And I learned a lot from him through that process. And we both taught each other a lot in Ableton and, and in the, like honed our own skills working together. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, either just doing research on, uh, YouTube or forums online or collaborating with other people that you know are starting to work with the, the programs you're interested in are, are probably the best ways to start going about it. Any other advice or tips that you would give to somebody either wanting to become a music producer or hoping, hoping to find uh, a way to get into the music scene in New York and in the theater world? Sure. I mean, behind all of this needs to be a musical foundation, right? So I think that's one of the things that's helped me most in doing the work that I've done is that I've, I always approach even electronic music design from the mindset of an orchestrator, right? So I, I think if I had not had the training that I've had in how to make different soundscapes with acoustic instruments, you're never going to understand how to go further with your electronic music design either, right? Um, so I think having that knowledge of music theory and orchestration and instrumentation is always going to make you a more desirable uh, electronic music artist as well. Um, especially because in working in the world of theater, you know, you, you need to read music. Uh, you need to understand how your product is going to interact with whatever's happening live in the pit, right? Um, and you just need to like speak that language with the other musicians you're, you're working with. So I know there's a lot of amazingly talented electronic music designers and technicians out there that can do all the things that I've been doing, but they may not necessarily have the right kind of uh, vocabulary or uh, musical training uh, in order to actually work in the same jobs that I've done. So I think that's probably the, the biggest piece of advice that I give is continue your, your music education as well. Yeah. Any other uh, things that we should cover or uh, that you were hoping to, to talk about before, before we go? Do you want to get into the super nerdy questions? <laughs> <laughs> Those were for me and I didn't want to necessarily like <laughs> bog down. Um, but I wanted to know, like, is there a redundant system for Ableton? I know oftentimes you have a backup computer, like with QLab running the show in sequence. So if one computer goes out, you have another computer there. I, with mm -hmm. a, something as mission critical as QLab, like there has to be some kind of quick redundant system or something happening there. 
Yes, always. <laughs> so uh, there's always going to be two computers running the same Ableton file in tandem, right? Uh, and two interfaces, uh, and each of them are all connected with switcher devices. So you're going to have a you know, screen switcher, a uh, audio switcher between the two interfaces, and whatever device you're using to actually control the playback from Ableton, like one of these foot pedals, for instance, is going through a system that is controlling both of the computers at the same time, right? Um, so uh, usually that's achieved through MIDI, right? So on Hamilton and Deere Hansen, for instance, we're using MIDI solutions, uh, F8 uh, foot switch like modules, uh, and Anytime the percussionist or conductor hits one of these pedals, it's controlling the main and the backup at the same time. And if you switched between the two computers mid-show, it would be a seamless transition as if nothing happened. And even the soundboard operator might not know that you, you switched between them. So it, it should be that, <laughs> that seamless, right? So yes, always a redundant system. I, in live theater, you have to be, I mean, the, so much is at stake there that you can't just leave that to, to chance. Yeah, yeah. Is it a uh, are things physically routed to to QLab? Is it run over USB network MIDI or it's network MIDI? Yeah, to, to QLab. Mm -hmm. What about the time code? The time code. Uh, I'm trying to remember how it's actually run. I believe it's just through. I think it's just through XLR out of the interface to a time code reader. Because we're sending timecode just as a wave file, you know, it's just on its own audio channel. It's not like any kind of special format or anything. So it's going to the the timecode reader that is then, you know, connected to firing the cues. So and there's probably a lot more to it than that that I know about, but <laughs> <laughs> that's how I understand it. That was just, that was just a, a question. And then the other one was about a, a panic button. You kind of talked about how in, in the perfect scenario, whoever's interacting with Ableton is just hitting go. It's mm -hmm. going to next scene you hit go again it's going to go on but you right. do the next and last like if you hit it by mistake you could stop it real quick go back and load that next the previous scene and then start again for sure yeah that in in the loop in space of a like actual panic button that would be the way to go about it is either using those foot pedals that we have set up to for just like previous and next in the order or we also generally set up um keyboard shortcuts to jump to different songs so if you get really lost and you're on the wrong song, you could just hit the song number on your keyboard and jump to that song and be queued up where you need to go. So there's always kinds of fail safes in place for that thing. How much training do you need to provide whoever is going to interact with Ableton? I mean, I assume maybe I'm the percussionist, I'm coming in and I, I know all about the percussion equipment, but I've never worked with Ableton before. How much setup is there for for me do you provide that training on the ground like as you start a show in a new location mm -hmm. yeah so i do train each new um each new company of hamilton uh i will work with the percussion that's good percussions that's going to be starting that run right if they are getting subs then i'm not responsible for training their subs that's something they have to do but you know each first percussionist I'll, I'll train and it's honestly not a lot of training in Ableton itself it's mostly just understanding the the system as a whole and understanding how those pedals function uh, and just very light troubleshooting of um, you know if your audio is gone here's where to look in Ableton to find out where the audio is being routed that that kind of a thing but but there's no actual like programming knowledge that needs to be communicated um, and it's also part of the sound department's responsibility to actually uh, power up the computers and do like a test of Ableton before every performance before the musicians even get there so when you're a percussionist on Hamilton you show up to play the show the computer's already on and set up for you and like queued up for the top of the show. And you know that someone has already tested both the main and backup systems for you. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> opening, opening Ableton for the first time is maybe not the most intuitive thing, but controlling one of these shows is, is at the point where if you've done your job correctly, it's really just hitting one button throughout. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 
Scott, thank you so much for for sitting down and, and doing with this. I'm so pleased that we would be able to to share this with our students. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I, I hope that everyone is inspired to learn a little bit more about Ableton. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, free resources out there if you want to just play around with it. And I know that Ableton uh, right now is doing a 90-day trial instead of a 30-day trial when you get the trial version. And it's like full functionality trial version. So that's a good thing to check out. And I think they also have a discount right now on actually purchasing the software. So it's a good time to play around with it. <laughs> I hope they do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.